Hello and good afternoon. I'm very, very honoured to be here at the NASA 50th birthday lecture series. It's a great honour to be here talking to you. You've heard my father telling you about why we need to travel into space. Well, I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you why we think we need to have a next generation who wants to travel into space as well. As my father said, at the moment, we face a paradox. Never before have science and technology played such a big part in our lives. And yet, at the same time, it seems that children are turning away from science. They're losing interest in science, and they're not studying it. So I'd like to talk a bit about what we learn from children what we learned about children and science education, and how NASA makes a great contribution to ensuring that the next generation does engage with science. Last year, my dad and I published a book for kids. It's an adventure story in which all the adventures are based on real science. It's about a little boy who lives next door to a scientist. And this scientist has an amazing computer called Cosmos. And Cosmos is so powerful and so intelligent, he can draw a doorway through which you can walk to any part of the known universe that you want to visit. Now, when I told some people at NASA about Cosmos, the fictional computer, they said, oh, I wish we had one of them, because that would help our budget enormously. <laughs> now, my father wanted to work on this project because of his high level of concern about children and science education. Now, that's not saying that we set out to persuade every child to be a scientist, because our world needs people with a wide variety of skills. But science affects all of us, and it matters to all of us, and it will do even more so in the future. The children of today are the adults of tomorrow, and they need to have a basic understanding of science if they're going to make the kind of decisions that will affect us all. And we're going to need scientists as well, not just to work on space travel, but to work on issues that face us all, like climate change, or fuel sources, or food production. Now, some recent research has highlighted the fears about children and science education. In the United Kingdom, a recent survey found that a third of UK school children believe that wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill was the first man to walk on the moon. I'm sorry about that. NASA, Neil Armstrong. And the, the statistics that came with this survey are not very heartening either. They found that 40% of children thought Mars was a chocolate bar. 35% of children said the Earth was not an official planet. And extraordinarily, 72% could not identify the moon from pictures. Now, just in case you're sitting there feeling smug, I'm afraid the results in the USA are really not looking much better. <laughs> Only 4% of US adults, when asked, could name a living scientist who they would nominate as a science role model. Although, at the same time, 96%, a stunning 96% of US adults think that it is important for the US to be a leader in science education. So it all sounds rather gloomy, but there is hope. As I found out when I went on a worldwide schools lecture tour with a talk called Surfing the Solar System, it's about the sort of concepts of astronomy and theoretical physics that we set out to cover in our book. Now, I've probably spoken, we estimate, I've probably spoken to about 20,000 kids worldwide. And what I discovered was an enormous appetite and enthusiasm for science. And we were asked so many questions that we have to write another book in order to be able to answer them. And they're great questions like, can you skateboard on Jupiter? And what my personal favorite is, what does happen if you get to the edge of the universe? <laughs> now, you could say that we're just lucky, that we've got the rock star end of science at our disposal. And without a doubt, I can tell you that black holes presented by Stephen Hawking, explained simply for kids, is a winner. We had them. We had them with us all the way. But more seriously, 
Some research at universities in the UK shows that a significant percentage of students studying sciences, and I mean across the board, this isn't just physics, report that their interest in science was sparked by exactly these topics. They went on to become scientists because of an early interest in astronomy and the exotic phenomena of theoretical physics. That space has the power to capture children's imagination and engage their curiosity, there seems absolutely no doubt. And we have never needed to do this more urgently. Now, of course, it's not just what we say to kids, it's what we show them. The images sent back by NASA's Hubble play such a huge part in capturing kids' attention in an ever-increasingly crowded world with many, many demands on them. This means we can show kids something of the cosmic environment that surrounds them, from Saturn's rings to getting them to think about what would it be like to see a sunset on Mars. Now, manned spaceflight is a topic which kids never tire of. And because of NASA, they can read about it, they can hear about it, watch documentaries, look at photographs, and visit space centers. NASA runs a huge number of educational programs, both in and outside schools. This means that kids' space dreams aren't limited to science fiction. And with exciting new missions planned, back to the moon and onwards to Mars, it means that there may be kids now who will grow up wanting to be astronauts, as excited about it as a whole generation of astronauts today are, the ones who watched the Apollo moon landings in their pyjamas with their parents and decided they were going to grow up to be an astronaut. And that's certainly an awful lot more aspirational than wanting to grow up to appear on reality TV show or become a pop star. Because of NASA, we can also show kids what our planet, what the Earth looks like from space. They can see what a beautiful planet we live on, but how vulnerable it is, how fragile it is, and we can really make it clear to them that they need to look after it. When we look around us in space, we see all sorts of other fascinating, extraordinary, exciting worlds, but we don't see another planet nearby exactly like the Earth. And that's a very strong message to kids, to say, you live on a beautiful planet, please look after it. So we're not saying that all children need to grow up and go into space, but we are saying that the work done by NASA has a profound and lasting impact on the way that children view their life on Earth, their cosmic environment. It can influence the choices they make in the future and their careers. I'd like to close with a fan letter we had from Ben, age six. His mother had told us he wasn't a confident child, but that he loved reading about space so much that it has changed his life. He wrote to us to say, now that I know I'm good at space, I've decided to become a scientist when I grow up. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'll hand you back. <laughs>